We're going to begin, everyone. Can you, are we put more seats out because we have a large crowd and we're happy about that? A um, couple more coming in, I can see. Um, so anyway, good evening and welcome. We're so happy to see a good crowd. Um, this is the first program for the year for the Historical Society, Chesterfield Historical Society. And we will have more as the year goes on. And we're so pleased to have David Mann, who has been among us here in Chesterfield for many a year. He and I have served on several boards together. Um, and we have recruited him to now come back on the Chesterfield Historical Society board as well. He has been a surveyor for well over 50 years. Um, and I'm going to actually let him tell you a little story about himself. Um, he can go ahead. What I want to do is go over a few little particulars. We have a table up here, many of you have seen already, that has a wealth of information that people can peruse. And there is a sign up for anyone who would like a program emailed to them. We have refreshments over on the right-hand side over here. And feel free to come and go as during the program, we plan to have a, an intermission. It's a long program. We realize that. People are going to get sick of sitting. Feel free to get up and move around. Restrooms are out this door, the last doorway on the right, and they're marked. So feel free to go if you need. I think I've covered it all. So okay. go ahead, David. All right. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> and sometimes things don't come to mind as quick as they used to. So if you see me struggling, just imagine one of those little circles over my head going around and around <laughs> saying, loading, loading. And that's what's happening. Um, my first experience with the transit was when I was eight years old. A neighbor kid down the road, Gary, his father was a surveyor. And his father had a transit set up in the dining room instead of a table. And he had a board built around it so us kids could get up on it and look through the telescope. To us, that was a telescope on a pirate ship, you know? <laughs> so that was my first experience with the transit. Little did I know then that I would run one for 50 years, but um, it's been a ride. Uh, so I have a, 122 slides in this presentation, and we expect it to last two hours. So that gives me about Two minutes a slide, is my math right? <laughs> so I want to begin as quick as I can and get through these. I usually would do this in about four hours, but we don't have four hours. So, But there's, I want to get through this. And I'm going to do another one of these in a little more detail um, again in a few months that will fill in some blank parts of what we'll skip over here in, too fast. So anyway, next. Um, I'm going to start in 1607. This is Champlain's uh, plan, plan of the New England coast. This, um, oh, I'm supposed to use this little thing here instead of going up and pointing. Right there, there's this little bump he drew, and that intrigued me. And I went and I found his journal. Next. Um, and right here, he says, from, from here, and he's tra traver this is when he was traversing the coastline there and mapping the coastline. He says, from here, large mountains can be seen west, in which is the dwelling place of the savage captain called Anita. I don't know anything about the savage captain or any of that kind of stuff, but the mountains were the, were the white mountains. And down here, um, these, these voyages are all available from, uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and a, and a geographer named, I'm going to mess up his name, but it's Richard Hakluyt, and, um, or Hakluyt, I'm not sure. 
And um, he compiled all these Siemens journals back then and added these notations to them of, about where they were or somebody else did along the way, but, but they're there. And this one right here says that he was um, 119, the White Mountains in New Hampshire towering above 600 and, it's probably 6,225 feet. I think it's probably something different than that now uh, because the datum changed. And, uh, but there were other Spanish sailors that reported seeing those mountains too. This part of his journal is his description of when he sailed by the New Hampshire coastline. And, um, and it gives an interpretation of it down here. It's just interesting if you ever go online and want to find Champlain's journal, you can read through his journal. It's been translated from I don't, uh, French, I assume, but I don't think he was French. Um, next. Uh, everybody knows uh, this guy? And... Uh, this is, um, <laughs> John Smith, and uh, he, um, when he traversed the New Hampshire coastline, he said, here should be no landlords to rack us with high rents or extorted fines to consume us. Here every man may be a master of his own labor and land in a short time. And then he goes on to talk about how pleasant it was fishing here. Next, um, Francis Cook came over on the Mayflower. This guy is the first surveyor in New England and the one that laid out the first land and the one, first one to pass the surveying profession on to his son. And, um, it, this is interesting. I don't know if Dave Ewald came here tonight, but Dave Ewald lives in town. He's a surveyor, and this is his ancestor. And um, next. In uh, 1638, this is kind of getting into the beginnings of how New Hampshire gets formed and set up. And there was a survey done, and, and it's through the years, it's become known as the Gardner, John Gardner survey of the Merrimack River. And Massachusetts had this done in order to determine where the three mile line was north of the Merrimack River and where they were gonna to claim to where their, for their boundary. And, um, but this survey uh, is hard to find. The actual survey was done by Nathaniel Woodward, um, was the surveyor. Uh, John Gardner would have been 14 at the time of the survey, and it's speculated that he's not mentioned in the field notes of this survey. And, um, but it's he uh, worked with uh, Nathaniel Woodward all the time, so it's speculated that he's there. He just didn't get mentioned because he was a kid. And then from his, the uh, plan that Nathaniel Woodward did is missing. So the plan that John Gardner did is the only, after, from notes that he had, is the only one that exists. Whether it's a tracing of Woodward's plan or his own work, I don't, nobody knows. Next. Um, this is a 1639 Vinca Boone's plan. It has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's a pay, I use it as a page break, but these plans are beautiful. There's one of them on the table over there. Um, and the thing that I like or is interesting about them is this is the Connecticut River and this is Lake Champlain. <laughs> Does anybody see anything wrong with that? <laughs> And this, this error carries through for many years. Uh, next. Um, in 1652, again, Massachusetts trying to establish their claim to this three mile line above the Merrimack, um, sends Simon Willard to 
survey the Merrimack River again. Um, in surveying the Merrimack this time, they made it to Endicott Rock. Did anybody ever been up to Winnipesaukee and seen Endicott Rock? It's, it has the surveyor's initials carved in the rock up there. If you ever go up there, it's kind of, it's inside this little building protected and, and the, it's, um, but Simon Willard was, is important for a different reason and important to our area because he's the next. Um, he's the one that, this is a kind of a copy of the survey that he did, but it's from a later date and some of the towns that they around Concord and up in that area were laid out based on the, that survey. Uh, next. Uh, this is Simon Willard's um, uh, chain of title, if you will. Um, Simon begets um, Henry, and Henry, his third born, was Colonel Josiah Willard. And uh, everybody here heard that name before, Josiah Willard? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then Josiah was the original um, commander at Fort Dummer in Brattleboro. And next, his son was Josiah Willard Jr. And Josiah Willard Jr. and Josiah Willard and all of their brothers and cousins and everybody you can imagine were grantees in Chesterfield. All the Willards listed there, they're all related. Uh, next, Josiah Willard Jr., um, and they're all surveyors. They were, they were all surveyors, except for Henry. I never ran into anything on Henry of him ever surveying anything. And, um, and so uh, this is just an outline of, of Josiah Willard Jr.'s life. And he ended up settling in um, West Winchester. And, he, um, and he's buried there. Uh, this is his, he's got a table stone, kind of interesting, set up on six piers. Hmm. And somebody put a plexiglass top on it to try to preserve the, the carving in the top. And uh, it's pretty hard to see. I, I have a picture of it, but it didn't um, come out well. Okay, now we're gonna, we kinda digressed a little further along in, in who these people were just because of that connection. This map here is 1657 uh, Brassini map and it, of New France. And, and I've cut it up a little bit, but um, the, uh, this gives the French perspective of where New France was, and is kind of defines the conflict that, will, that is happening and will happen between the settlements along, the English settlements here and the French settlements there, and when they start to merge into each other, and the Indians being squished in between. Does anybody have any trouble with me calling them Indians? No? Okay. I, I can go, you know, Aboriginal or uh, Natives <laughs> or whatever, but um, my, my grandmother's uh, Cherokee, which, so I have the blood, so, and the, and the curvy tooth, I'm told. <laughs> the roots on your tooth are curved. I mean, are like corkscrews. Uh, next. Um, has anybody besides Tom and Paula Dustin ever heard of Mrs. Rowlandson? <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, the um, this this uh, can somebody hand me that little book right there? It has this map in it, right uh, to the yeah that one right there. In uh, 1990, I found this little book in some bookstore. 
said Lancasteriana, a supplement to the early records and military annals of Lancaster, Massachusetts. And in there, it uh, mentions, it, this is the map from right here in the book, but it had Chesterfield in it. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. And it, and it goes through uh, Hinsdale. There's a diversion into Vernon, and they come through Northfield. And uh, um, so I investigated it a little bit. Next slide. And there's a um, book about um, Mary Rawlinson's captivity and restoration. And she was lucky to be um, sold back into uh, the British colony um, in Lancaster. And, um, but uh, this story um, needs to be studied better than what I've done. But I did a little bit to kind of um, give me an idea of how this fits in with terrain and that kind of stuff. Only, only so much I can do in so much time. Um, but this is, in some reports, was reported to be the first best-selling book in America. <laughs> and um, it went through, I forget how many printings, seven printings or something like that. And um, next. Um, in here, she makes a comment that that day, a little afternoon, we came to Squawkeeg. Does anybody know what Squawkeeg is? Yeah. It's the town in Northfield. And uh, so she came to Northfield. Next. Um, they, um, she was, uh, on tomorrow, they were going to cross the River Connecticut to meet King Philip. And uh, everybody know who King Philip was? Yeah. Um, uh, we traveled till night, and we must go over the river to Philip's crew, I think it is. Um, but next. And then she meets King Philip, and he wants to s smoke with her. And, um, and she wouldn't smoke with him. <laughs> and uh, so, um, and, but then she gets, he gets her to make him a shirt. He needed a shirt. So she made him a shirt, and he paid her one shilling for the shirt. She offered the shilling to her master when she was captured. The one Indian that captured her became her master, and she was beholding to him. And so she offered him the shilling, and he said, no, keep it. And she bought some meat to eat. And um, they were very, um, how do you say it? That little Sage. thing's going up here again. Um, they used money, and they bought and sold things. And, but there's an image of King Philip. I don't know how true it is to how he really was. I just got that off of Wiki. Next. Uh, next, she tries to talk them into selling, taking her to Albany and selling her to get powder for their rifles and stuff. Uh, next. Um, now we're at the 10th remove on this plan. Uh, it has the different, these 10th remove, 11th remove, are all uh, pictured on this plan. But this plan has to have been done at a later date because the town names don't correspond with um, uh, 1675. So, uh, and this book was written in 1900. So somewhere between 1675 and, well, it would have to be after 1760, I think, to 1900, this plan was done. Or this was traced from another, I don't know. Uh, in the 10th, they start moving up the river. And this morning we took their travel, um, 
and tending a day's journey up the river, I took my lead, uh, my lead on my back. I'm not quite sure I know what that means. And, um, but then on the 11th remove, on the, they, um, uh, no, on the tent up here, lead on her back, and passed a, a over tiresome and worrisome, wearisome hills. One hill was so steep that I was fain to, to creep up upon my knees and to hold by the twigs and bushes to keep me from falling backward. Um, based on this map, they were going here, through Hinsdale, and up the face of one Tasticate Mountain. Wow. And that's Whoa. pretty descriptive of trying to climb that face of one Tasticate Mountain. Yeah. And uh, which would um, make me believe that when, uh, when they get to the end of that day, they're right up in here on top of Wentasticate somewhere um, in Chesterfield. And, uh, and then they stay there for a period of time. And the thing about this area that came to mind was as a place to camp for the Indians where um, there was water um, and there were uh, plentiful nuts, uh, acorns and chestnuts were plentiful then. So they were uh, talk about going and foraging for chestnuts and acorns. And they, in one point she talks about going from there down to the river. She says it's two miles, but uh, I don't know how she made determinations of how far a mile was, you know, just by walking, but um, <coughs> I don't know. It, up that hill on Wontasticate, it might be two miles to there. <laughs> it feels like two miles anyway. And, um, but then eventually they stay there for a while. Then they try tell her that they were going to take her home. And then she starts home and the, the wife or the squaw of the, her master um, decides that she's not going to go and she won't let her go. But her master goes on, and, but apparently, and then she has to stay here. So she was really excited that she was going to go home, only to be dashed and told that she was staying. And then, um, and so uh, uh, they stayed there for a while, but eventually uh, the master comes back and they all make their trek back down through the way she had originally come, and she made it home. Uh, next, I'm going to skip through these for the time. Um, 1677, this is um, Hubbard's map of New England. Um, this went with a history that he, the history of New England, and this was a map that was in the book. And uh, the part of the reason I put that this in here was that call for the town of Squawky right there that she referred to. And, um, and it shows some other things, Winnipesaukee and the White Mountains. And uh, next, yeah, north is this way. Uh, this map is 1680 Barry Sanson map. Um, New England isn't very detailed, and I didn't show it for that. The interesting thing about this map is California is shown as an island. <laughs> and and this, this error is on many plans uh, um, for, for several years. And, um, but finally, they get it straightened out, and they get it right. Next. Uh, this is the Spanish perspective. You know, they own everything. And, um, uh, but I like this map because of the little devil cherubs, or demon cherubs, I guess, and the, um, the sea beasts. And um, 
Who is it that carries the trident? Neptune yeah, or Poseidon. Yeah, one of those guys yeah. is right there. Next. <laughs> Okay, the, I, I'm using these as page break. This is uh, 1685 Vischer. Th these are all um, Dutch cartographers, this ma these maps. Again, Connecticut River, Lake Champlain. <laughs> and, uh, but now we have turkeys and beaver on here, I think. And uh, okay, next. <coughs> This is Cotton Mather's map that he made to, uh, as part of his, um, I forget the name of the book. I, I wrote it down over there, but it doesn't matter. Somebody here remembers what Cotton Mather wrote? No. Um, but he shows Endicott Tree. And, uh, and there was, in that first survey that I mentioned, I forgot to say that when they surveyed up there, they measured a point to three miles above the river, and, and they marked a tree there, and it was called, and blazed a tree, and they called it Endicott's tree. And Endicott's tree shows up on different maps at different times. This one, the, the location is on the wrong side of the river, but, you know, I, it, it's there, and it was kind of interesting. Next, please. Um, we're uh, up to about um, the title on that. I forgot to put it on. Uh, 1703 to 1715, there was this dispute between the colony of Connecticut and the um, uh, colony of Massachusetts. Massachusetts was good at starting conflicts with their neighbors and, and, and sometimes profiting by them. But um, there were... Um, four different places where uh, these equivalent lands were developed when the line between Connecticut and Massachusetts was settled. Um, Massachusetts ended up keeping some towns that were in Connecticut that had already been settled. And in order to keep them, they had offered Connecticut equivalent lands across Massachusetts. One equivalent land I know is Belchertown, and there's another town next to Belchertown, I believe, that is an equivalent land. But the one that we're interested in is the 43,943 acres. That, uh, that piece is shown on the next slide. No, it isn't. This is the dispute. There's the two areas that, that Massachusetts kept. These are still bumps in the uh, Connecticut mass line. Hmm. And here's our guy, Woodward, that surveyed the Merrimack River. He, he's on this survey as well. Uh, next. Um, then uh, this is the description of the 43,000 um, <clears throat> square feet of land. And this sketch down here was done by uh, Dave Allen. It's in one of his um, books. I forget what, which one I got it out of. And, um, but just to talk about the description for a second, the east, southeast, or the north, northeast, west, northwest, seem kind of general. But if you take those, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, here's the equivalent lands. Go to the next slide. Those have a very specific uh, compass direction. And I presume that's how Dave plotted that in there based on the north. And, um, but, uh, it's complicated to try to reconstruct these things in, in today's world versus the world in 1703 to 1715. Uh, I think it's the next slide, Tony. Now go one more. Um, these are uh, the magnetic field on the Earth causes um, influence 
and along these lines. And that magnetic field is, is always changing and morphing a little bit. And NOAA, these are from the NOAA website. And, and you can get it, this is for the year 2022. And the um, declination that passes about through us, the nearest one to us, is 14 degrees. Magnetic is 14 degrees west of true. And, um, but in the 1801, I couldn't get it to click on 1800. It wanted to go 1801 or 1799. <laughs> and um, it was seven degrees. Hmm. And then in 1700, it was eight degrees. But you can see the influence. This one's kind of running in a northwesterly direction. This is more westerly. So each time you would move from here to there, if you go halfway in between, that may be, uh, you know, on this one, seven, that might be seven and a half degrees. So you, you kind of need to know your latitude and longitude of where you're at. And then you can plug that into this program on NOAA, and they'll tell you what that declination was for that year. And then you've got to go and interpret those bearings that were given at a specific time in the past and then convert them into, um, into a bearing in today's world. And it's, um, it's really hard to visualize that. I always, when I was trying to do that, I would, I would make overlays and make it so that it was something visual I could see um, of how it was working. Uh, next. This is a kind of our first, well, not our first new, uh, Josiah Willard was our first Chesterfield surveyor. Um, not, he didn't live here, but he did a lot of surveying in Chesterfield and I think probably laid out many of the original lots. Um, but Nathan Wild lived uh, over near where Neil lives and um, I'm not sure exactly what, if his house would still be there, but he owned a 150 to 200 acre farm in that area. And he started um, taking um, declination readings of the magnetic field at a specific place that he positioned. And year after year, he noted what that magnetic declination was. And, and um, as he went through this, at some point about right there, he decided I should write a almanac. And he started composing an almanac. And from 1819, up until some point here, he sold his almanac to some company in, in Massachusetts, and it moved down there, and the name was changed. And I'm not sure if he had anything to do with it anymore. <clears throat> he, he died somewhere here in Chesterfield. I mean, he probably died on his farm. But he, um, I tried to find where he was buried. His parents were buried up on... Um, at the Patridge Cemetery, the one that there's no access to. And um, I went up there and I looked and I was hoping to find him there, but it's not, he's not listed in the cemetery book. And so then I found a reference, well, I should, I'm, I claimed that, I didn't find it. <laughs> Jay Morris, who did, did some research for me, I happened to mention at a gathering that I was doing this and he said, oh boy, I'll find that. And, um, <laughs> and sure enough, I started getting emails for him. He started sending me information. And, uh, and we, but he did find this, this notation in one of the county um, histories that said that um, Nathan was interred at the Spofford Cemetery. Mm -hmm. But he's not listed there. So, but there are three unmarked graves in the Spofford Cemetery. I'm wondering if he might be one of those. I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that kind. 
<laughs> um, so there's more work to be done on Nathan. Um, I was unable to find even one of his, um, his uh, almanacs. But I, I would think that that might be something that, that the society should do. I don't know, maybe the society already has all of his almanacs somewhere. But uh, they, there must have been copies of them available to Orrin Randall because he has a lot of um, excerpts from them. And, um, but we'll go on. This, this ended up, it says 1888 up here because uh, this information came from um, one of Keene's uh, annual reports in 1918. The surveyor there who will meet later um, was interested in this and he compiled this and then he compiled his own uh, declination report for years after he found this and in Keene and he set up a, a true north line in Wheelock Park which I just found out about when I was doing this and I am anxious to go over and see if I can find the monuments that he set for this true north line and anyway next oh we're back to um, Connecticut River Lake Champlain a different map these are just beautiful maps but there's a, there's an inherent flaw in them. Uh, next one, Northfield. Uh, Northfield, I, I put 1685, 1733. Uh, it, there should be another date here, 1672, I believe, is the original layout. And, um, and that original layout was based on an, on an Indian deed that, that the proprietors got. And, uh, and, but the locations and the bounds of Northfield kind of fluctuated a little bit between the grants. And, and even in this one, this is a map by um, Timothy Dwight. And you can see, I put this in here so you can see where the state line cuts through Northfield pr approximately now. This is um, Douglas's 1753 map. There's a lot of flaws in this map and everything, but, but things are, you know, schematically correct, um, but not accurate. Next. Um, Timothy Dwight, um, survey in Northfield, and then it talks in here about the court, the mass court, decided that, they, yeah, we like your plan, but on, uh, on the lower end at the Three Mile Meadows and from thence measure eight miles up the Connecticut River, well, agreeable to the representation of Mr. William Clark's survey of the first committee. So it's going back to that 1685 plan and trying to incorporate part of the old survey into the new survey. And I, I'm not sure whether this map represents that change or whether there's a change that still needed to be made. Next. Um, 1723, very important time for uh, Chesterfield in that Fort Dummer is, is um, I guess, uh, authorized. It wasn't built yet, but in order to protect the frontier, Massachusetts decided to build Fort Dummer. Uh, next, Fort Dummer, this was the plan for Fort Dummer. Um, there's a later plan and some other information. You could do a whole uh, re presentation on Fort Dummer alone and through the years. Next. Um, to fulfill the provisions contained in the vote to which Lieutenant Governor Dummer gave his assent, Colonel Stoddard of Northampton was ordered to superintend the building of the blockhouse 
and that was and they went there. Uh, Lieutenant Timothy Dwight, who's one of our surveyors, uh, who with a competent force consisting of four carpenters, twelve soldiers, with narrow axes, not broad axes, and two teams, commenced um, operations on the third of February, seventeen twenty-four. In, in the complete one of these, there's a, um, an Indian guide that goes with them. And, he, and it's in, in the accounts, he gets paid more than any of the, uh, these guys. And uh, next. OK, 1733, uh, the town of Arlington, now Winchester, sometimes in early times referred to as Arlington, um, but Arlington stuck, was surveyed by Joseph, see that Joseph right there? Joseph Blanchard, um, surveyor. And when this survey was done, this is the Chesterfield line. Um, excepting the river that was probably surveyed for the equivalent lands, this is the first survey of one of the lines of Chesterfield. And um, this is not very legible, but I went to the mass court records, next slide. And this is that same information on the plan, but in, a little easier to read. And, uh, but it's Joseph Blanchard's surveyor. Uh, next. And this is, um, 1733, the plan of Lower Ashwila. These are, um, the Arlington survey was done, but I doubt if it was complete when they had sent another survey team up to survey Lower and Upper Ashwila. And uh, this is a plan of the Lower Ashwila. And um, the yellow there would represent the survey of the east line of Chesterfield, the first time that it was surveyed. Next. Uh, I didn't have a good copy of Keene, but I took this out of the town history, uh, the annals, no, not the annals, the town history, I think. But I think our little nook out of the northeast corner was surveyed as part of this. Um, and, and so there, there, now we've got kind of two sides in our little nook and the river kind of marking out the town of Chesterfield. Uh, next, uh, they platted the townships and they returned, uh, let's see, this is, uh, they, they returned the plats and Colonel Josiah Willard was granted um, the town of Arlington. He was one of the grantees of Arlington. So he's generally not listed as a surveyor there. It's, it lists um, um, Joseph Blanchard as the surveyor. I don't know if that was done. They didn't seem to pay much attention to, or worry about um, what was right or wrong or stealing somebody else's plan or work, surveying their own property or anything like that. They didn't worry about any of that kind of stuff. And, um, but I, I don't know, but it mentions um, three of our surveyors that affected the, the early surveys of the town lines of Chesterfield. <coughs> Next. This one, Thanks to Dave Allen, I have a um, report, an account of the expenses of the surveying. It says three townships. Um, there was, um, this, this is related to Lower Ashwheelet, Upper Ashwheelet, and a place called Puckwag, I think, or something like that, somewhere down in Massachusetts. And what was that? Uh-huh. And, um, and uh, so, but in here it gives, um, it lists who the surveyors were and, uh, and what they were paid. 
you know, for, per day and all of that. I didn't study it too much. Um, I'm sure they made more money than I did, so. <laughs> uh, but one that's listed here is um, Seth Field as a chainman. He, later on, he's, in, he's mentioned as a surveyor. So this may have been one of his first surveys, but Seth Field was from Northfield, Mass. And he was married to the preacher's daughter. Uh, next, uh, Nathaniel Dwight. Um, the Dwight family survey records, I, I had notations that some of them were at, da at Dartmouth College and some were at Yale. And then uh, Dave Allen and I went to the Stonehouse Museum in Belchertown where Dave had some idea that there were some Dwight records there. And we did find survey records, um, Dwight survey records there. And, uh, um, but in my, I haven't studied much at Dartmouth College yet, but Yale, I contacted the, I'm gonna say this wrong, but the Beinecke, Beinecke uh, Library at Yale. And, uh, and they, uh, gave me access to the Dwight collection there. And in that Dwight collection, I found some things, but it kept kicking me off because my um, internet connection wasn't solid enough and it, um, it uh, was frustrating. But, uh, and then Timothy Dwight uh, of Northampton was the commander at Fort Dummer and uh, was a surveyor. Next. <clears throat> the 1734 plan of Lower Ash Wheelett. Um, I, I just like the, there's a lot of spelling. And when I, when I read through some of them, I, I had a hard time understanding what they were saying, but a plat of a sartain. And I said, what's a sartain? And then I realized, oh, it's certain tract of land, you know? And, uh, and that's Nathaniel Dwight. And Nathaniel, a lot of his writings that you see, there's lots of things spelled like that. He kind of spelled things the way he said them, I think. Next. Um, I put this in here. It doesn't have anything to do with Chesterfield. But on the line between Keene and Swansea, they, they came up the river, they got out of their canoes or boats, and they picked a spot off, off the, a few rods off the bank of the Ashwillet River and said, okay, this is the line between Keene and Swansea. And then they started running the line in two directions from that point. And there was a tree there that they blazed. And today there's a, a granite monument there that when I first saw this, I went there and tried to find it. I found the uh, concrete, I mean the granite bound. And it's, it's called the Stacia Monument. And, um, and, the, uh, and it's printed right on it, Stacia Monument. And from that monument to the west, they blazed this figure. Does anybody know what that figure is? I looked around. I don't have any idea what it, what it stands for or anything like that. It's a pretty complicated thing to blaze. Yeah. And to the east, they just put three chops, which would make more sense. <laughs> and um, anyway, it was just interesting. My, my son Wesley and I went there, and we recovered this monument. I went and talked to the um, engineering department at the city of Keene, and they were interested enough in it that they, we all went back out there and I, with one of the surveyors from Keene, and they set up the, uh, their GPS equipment, and they got accurate GPS locations of where the monument was, and, and next. Um, 
1736, now we're getting into where um, number one gets established. And, uh, and it's established as part of a double tier of what I've always referred to as fort towns. Um, it says a frontier double line of townships as a barrier against the Indians. And that was the intent, was to have some kind of a fortification in all of these towns and, um, and try to protect, shield it like a shield from the French and Indians being able to come down into this area. <clears throat> Next. So in that 1736 period, this map would reflect uh, number one, number two, number three, Lower Ashwheelit and Upper Ashwheelit. Um, Chesterfield being right here, number one. It's kind of got a squatty configuration. <laughs> Up here, at this point in time, we'd be talking about Governor Belcher, I think. Is that right, Dave? 1736? Yeah, I'm definitely Belcher. But this little dashed line in here, I found some references that he reserved himself a farm that was partly in, in uh, Chesterfield and partly in, uh, in Westmoreland. And um, later on, this part of it down here becomes Wentworth's farm. I guess Wentworth thought that was a good idea. And, uh, <laughs> and next. Um, during this period of time, and, and since all of those maps in 1638 um, to 1652 and through the 1700s, Massachusetts and New Hampshire had been squabbling over where this boundary was. And, uh, and this, it finally was going to go before the, um, the Board of Trades, I think it was called in England. And, uh, and somebody produced this map, and I believe it's from a New Hampshire perspective, but they drew in all of the original grants of the colonies and how they should be lined up. <coughs> and uh, uh, it, it's interesting, it gives you a date and, of when the original, um, these aren't the original, uh, these were the most recent, because a lot of these original colonies, like New Hampshire, there was an original grant of Mariana. New Hampshire was originally granted as Mariana, and it was just a small along the coast area between the Charles River and the Piscataqua to John Mason. And then after that period of time, Mason was granted the New Hampshire expanded grant out a little further. And that original um, grant of New Hampshire, the, uh, uh, a village was set up in 1623 by David Thompson. It was strictly for fishing. And that's what um, Mason was in, uh, interested in, was getting fish, bringing them back to England, and making money. And uh, next, this is that same map. Um, in the meantime, Massachusetts has granted, not only did they grant the fort towns over here, but they had granted all kinds of towns up along the Merrimack River. Um, and, and this shows Massachusetts's claim in the, in the way that they finally did it was that their line goes up to here, and then it goes in both directions, all the way over to Saco, Maine, and back through as far as the, um, well, to the, to the Great Sea, the Great Western Sea. <laughs> and, um, and so, and then, but New Hampshire's claim was down here, kind of like that grant map. And so there's our conflict. And next. Oh, I, I was going to take this slide out, but I left it in just because 
Um, there, there were other Indian troubles that happened during this period of time. And anybody here know of uh, Greylock, Chief Greylock, yeah. and Greylock Mountain and all of that? Well, Gray, Greylock was from here. And, um, and it mentions him. And it's, it said that he was from Miskoy River area. And I found this map. And, and on the map, it says Village Savage. And uh, on it, so I, I think that was the Indian village shown on this map, but um, just interesting. But I left the part about Greylock out because I don't have time. Next, oh, break time. Break time. Where was that map supposed to be shown? What was that? That's a map of Lake Champlain, and oh, it's okay. it, it shows the whole lake. I only cut out this corner of it. Okay because it showed what I wanted to. Yeah. It's a beautiful map. And it shows all of these land grants by um, uh, France, which I don't know anything about those, you know, how, how that all, except for small <coughs> bits and pieces. So we can stretch our legs. OK, stretch. OK, now I'm, now I'm wondering. I, uh, I had this uh, microphone on the whole time I was going out and talking with people. I was wondering, did that get recorded on there? No. No? Oh, that's good. <laughs> I don't think I said anything I shouldn't have. But, uh... <laughs> and my wife told me that I'm making her dizzy by swinging this <laughs> thing. <around. laughs> so... <laughs> Oh. This, um, this document I found online, and it's supposed to represent, I've never seen it before. It came up, and I said, oh, I've never seen that before. But it's the order by it's King cool. George II, 1737, <laughs> settling the, the line between Cookies. New Hampshire and Mass. And, um, mm -hmm. and it's at the Anthenaeum. Is that right? Antheneum Reading Room at 9 Market Street in Portsmouth. Might be worth stopping there sometime and seeing what it is. Um, on the right, I, I gave privilege to that document. and I, This one was hard to make it any bigger, but this is the 1741 survey of the state line. I'm going to try not to be too crazy with this thing, but it, the state line runs right up there. And this is the Connecticut River. And, um, and right there is Fort Dummer. At this point in time, I'm not sure. It might be called the Block House on here, but I'm not sure. For a period of time, it was the fort. And then they would go into a peaceful period, and they would turn it into a blockhouse and a store and a trading post. And, um, uh, and then everything would go south, and it would go back to being a fort. And uh, Next. Um, this, after the settling of, I'm going to put that away. I'm going to keep clicking it if it's in my hand. Um, after the settlement of the boundary, it's reflected on here. The next complication, that's it right there, was how far to the west does New Hampshire go? Because the king said that the line that was surveyed was the line between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So, um, uh, New Hampshire took that, hey, um, that means our line extends further than we thought. And, uh, and so, so soon after that, um, Benning Whitworth is now the governor in, in New Hampshire. And uh, um, when this dispute was going on and nothing happened with it, Governor Belcher was the governor of New Hampshire and <clears throat> Massachusetts. So he had no incentive to take New Hampshire's claim forward. And um, it, it's um, kind of interesting how it 
Benning Wentworth saw the opportunity uh, kind of in the same light that Belcher was trying to do when he was trying to claim all that area by granting townships. So he said, well, that's a good idea. I'll start granting townships. <laughs> and so all of the, um, uh, most of the towns that were granted under Massachusetts that had already begun settlement. And I believe there was a, a um, edict by the king that said that if the people have started and completed the conditions of the Massachusetts grant, New Hampshire must honor those. And, um, and so, the, and they did in, the, in all of the towns that were like that. My Fitbit is buzzing at me. <laughs> I don't think I got 10,000 steps. <laughs> um, so, there were a lot of regranting of towns, and Chesterfield being one of them. Uh, Chesterfield, under number one, um, I, it was a guy named Chamberlain that was um, gi given the authority to call the first meeting, and, I, and he was from West Ford, um, Massachusetts. And I sent them an email, they never answered me the Historical Society down there. And I was just trying to find out something about him, and I was just wondering whether there were records. And the other thing that, uh, because they never really began their grant, they didn't end up having any rights in Chesterfield. And, um, and so when it was re-granted, it was um, a whole, I presume, a whole new set of uh, proprietors. Uh, however, there was a Chesterfield in Massachusetts, and I, I was going to go study their history mm -hmm. to see about the time correlation for those people that were that lost their grant in what became Chesterfield, and whether those people might have been that Chesterfield in Massachusetts might have been the compensatory grant or something. Um, but I haven't had a chance to look at that. But so. Um, Massachusetts, Connecticut signed an agreement with New York that their western boundary would be 20 miles east of the Hudson River. And Massachusetts claimed the continuation in 20 miles east of the Connecticut River. So when um, Belcher, Governor Belcher gave Richard Hazen the instructions to survey the line, the first thing he did, remember our discussion about the declination? He told him to use um, a declination that was like a degree different than the West dec declination would be. So it ended up that Massachusetts, by the time they get out to the 20 mile line, got about another mile of, um, <laughs> of land. And then, that caused friction between Massachusetts and New Hampshire for years until it was finally settled. Uh, but then Governor Wentworth said, well, 20 miles, that sounds good to me. And so he starts laying out towns um, in Vermont, what's now Vermont, um, at that 20 mile line. And, uh, and he laid out, I don't know how many towns, but we'll see. Next slide. Oh, um, in the Benneke Library, I found this letter from 1751. This is, um, but right up here, it's got, it's from, with Timothy Dwight, and he's trying to survey, he's been uh, commissioned to survey two more towns above Upper Ash Wheelet. And he, go, he hires a guy named Alexander from Northfield so that he wouldn't be dependent on the locals for information because this guy Alexander knew that area. And so he went up there and when he um, uh, got up there, it says here, um, Ash Willett River, but Colonel, Colonel Willard's son. 
So Colonel Willard and our Colonel Willard Jr. So Jr. was there um, and uh, already surveying land and that he also mentions in here that um, uh, when he gets there, there it is. Uh, we found that Colonel Blanchard's son and others had been there to survey Mason Patton and took all the land from the, I can't read what that says, but at any rate, there was no land left. They were allowed to um, survey in the Mason land and they were given permission to take any land in the unappropriated, any unappropriated land and add it to those townships. And so, um, he says here um, that we left disappointed. <laughs> but then they went over into Vermont and started laying out townships in Vermont. <laughs> so next one. Um, 1752, uh, this map is more or less just a page break. Uh, oh, there is one thing about this. There's a definition of where the New Hampshire line is here. It's kind of crude, but, and it doesn't follow 20 miles off, but, but it also doesn't follow the Connecticut River. Mm. And uh, next slide. So here in 1752, Chesterfield gets laid out. There's this map. It still seems kind of squatty. Um, and um, uh, I haven't studied it too much to see how it matches with the, um, what's shown on that, the 1736 map. I was thinking that maybe they just traced that 1736 map when they did this and called it Chesterfield, but there is a description with it. Next. This um, is, um, I, this Endicott tree is in here. And there was something, in, this is that Douglas plan from 1753. And uh, he gives some interesting information about how he oriented his plan and where he, what he used for control and his latitudes and departures, which is survey gobbledygook, but next slide. Uh, this is that same plan, and here we are, Northfield, and, but everything's much further along now. So this plan, though, it became the basis for lots of other plans because the, um, I think the uh, positioning of everything, all of the rivers and everything were relatively correct, as correct as any of them were in those days. There was no, there's no um, Lake Champlain and Connecticut River being transpositioned. <laughs> um, next slide. That's pretty funny. Here's one from, there's the new line, Fort Dummer, and it shows the boundary between um, New York and New Hampshire being here. Uh, next slide. <laughs> and here's the other perspective where New Hampshire's showing themselves over to the 20 mile line. And um, next slide. And uh, this is a copy of the Blanchard and Langdon map. When you go back and you re research a lot of these townships and when they're laid out, every once in a while you'll run into this reference that it says, as shown on the Great Plan. And I said, well, what the heck's the Great Plan? <laughs> and, um, and so I finally decided that when they're referring to the Great Plan, I think this is it, the Blanchard <laughs> and Langdon map. Um, Joseph Blanchard, who surveyed Arlington and surveyed our southern boundary, 
is famous for this map, but he went on um, during the French and Indian Wars, at the tail end of the French and Indian Wars, he went on expedition to Fort Frederick and that way, and, and he ended up coming home and he died. Mm -hmm. and, and other people took over this mapping project, uh, which was Samuel Langdon, I believe. But on this map, you can clearly see the Masonian line, 60 miles, and, the, and them trying to make that curve there. And so the, the land that was granted this side were all granted under the Masonian patent, and all the land granted out here were New Hampshire grants. Um, so, um, and here's uh, Chesterfield sitting right in there. And uh, let's see, here's Wilmington. And there's Malcolm's Mar Marlboro, right there. Um, next slide. This is another version of that same plan. From, and they're sometimes dated 1756, sometimes 1761. And I think all of those are true. Um, I think it started in 1756, maybe even before, as the Great Plan, and they just kept adding to it. And you can see this one's got new towns penciled in on it here. And many of these ended up actually being uh, granted under... Uh, this, this map I got from the um, Library of Congress. Okay. And, uh, and if you go to the Library of Congress and just, I think I, for this one, I just searched New Hampshire. And then just flick through them and then you'll be lost for hours, but you'll find this one in there. <laughs> I, I mean, it's fun lost. It's like watching TV, you know. Better. Next. Um, this, this I put in here because of, of something Donna said to me about, I don't know, a picture of George Washington or something like that. So this is, um, this is a monument to three surveyors and a conservationist ornithologist. I hope I spelled that right. Um, so next slide. Um, in 1751, Peter Jefferson was a sheriff and a surveyor, and, um, and he uh, put together this plan of the middle uh, of Virginia and Maryland. And uh, I put this little part of it in here only because my ancestors came ashore right there in 1647. <laughs> and, um, but his helper was a guy named Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and uh, next slide. This is George Washington's plan of his farm. Um, when um, Lawrence and um, Austin Washington inherited all of the valuable Washington lands, and it left George with not much for a future. George ended up getting, though, uh, inherited Augustine Washington's surveying equipment at the age of 16. And he embarked on his first career. George headed across the Blue Ridge Mountains, then considered the western frontier to survey land for Thomas Lord Fairbanks, or Fairfax. Next uh, slide. This is a representation. I, bu I bought this at an at a, uh, auction like that. Um, I was the high bidder, and I walked home with this, this uh, picture of George, the young George Washington. I assume this right here is part of the cherry tree. <laughs> uh, next slide. Um, Thomas Jefferson followed in his uh, father's footsteps. 
and it gives um, a description of him and some of the survey work he did. Next slide. Uh, this was his commission as the surveyor of Ar Abermale Marl County in Virginia. Next slide. He had this instrument made by a guy named Jesse Ramsden. Jesse Ramsden was an eminent instrument maker of that period of time based in London, and he commissioned this to be done, uh, to be made. And he used this to observe peaks in the Blue Ridge Mountains and all that, and he used it up until he was 72 years old. Um, next. Uh, this is Abraham Lincoln's survey equipment. Amazing. It's in a museum. Um, it lists um, some of the treatises that he studied from to learn surveying. Next slide. Those, that equipment um, ended up uh, the compass staff chain used by Lincoln while deputy surveyor in Sagamon County. The instruments were manufactured in Pennsylvania in the 1700s. In November 1834, they were sold by the sheriff along with Lincoln's horse, saddle, and bridle to satisfy a debt left by the failure of the Barry Lincoln store. <laughs> That's how, why he had to become a lawyer. <laughs> he lost his survey equipment. And then we have the conservationist, Teddy Roosevelt. 230 million acres conserved. He set up the National Park System and the Forest Service. And next. And now we're back to where we're supposed to be. Um, Cheshire County map has a date on it of 1767. I struggled a little bit. Um, I'm thinking that um, uh, Cheshire County was, the, the county system probably started trying to be established in 67, but it, it never, finalized until 1771 that the county was actually set up. But this map here, I, I believe, came from, Dave gave me this. Uh, um, I think it's from the Historical Society or the State Library, I'm not sure which. And, uh, but there's a copy of this map, and I've, I wanna go and check and see if it's exactly the same recorded at the Cheshire Registry of Deeds. And um, next. So um, we've gotten beyond, and I didn't say much about it, 1764, when the king, um, what, what do they call that when you take care of your, your kin? Nepotism? <laughs> the king's nepotism fixed the boundary between New Hampshire and Vermont on the Connecticut River. And, um, and so what, and that left Brattleboro in a county called Cumberland County. And uh, next slide. Oh, uh, this is, um, this kind of shows the towns laid out and the, I guess, New Hampshire, Vermont perspective of the boundary, and this caused great friction in Vermont for many years. And the, uh, the guy that drew this plan is Captain um, Montresor. Has anybody heard of Captain Montresor? Captain Montresor was the one that captured um, Nathan Hale. And, um, and, and his, I, I don't want to credit him for executing Nathan Hale, but, um, but he was executed. But in his um, gentlemanly fashion for a British soldier, he took all of Nathan Hale's um, personal effects and delivered them to the um, US side. And when he did that, he also delivered him the, his last words, which were? 
Yeah. <laughs> and that's a, a painting of um, Montresor. There's many, he was a, quite a cartographer. Next. <clears throat> okay, Vermont dispute. I made this plan in 2009 for something I was doing there. And these were all of the plant towns that I researched in New Hampshire that voted because of the neglect from the government of New Hampshire. They, they thought, well, we'd be better off if we were part of Vermont. <laughs> and um, uh, so these towns all voted to be part of, of Vermont. Over here, there's about 11 towns, I think, in New York that felt slighted by New York, and they <laughs> voted to be part of Vermont as well. So this is kind of a, um, a sketch of what Vermont might have been <laughs> as a republic. I did find this one coin that Vermontus um, publica, 1785. This is during the period of time after uh, George Washington has his meeting with uh, Ira and Allen and, um, and then and tells him to cease and desist or he'll send the troops up and put down the rebellion and give it to New York. And, um, and he, but he said, he, we, he, with that, he said um, that I will work to try to make Vermont the 14th state. And, um, and on this coin, on the reverse, it, it says decima stellae quarta, which I'm not real familiar with my Latin or anything, but that's, I think that says 14. And, um, and it was, this coin was dedicated to becoming the 14th state. And um, next slide. So New Hampshire voted, I mean Chesterfield voted to be part of Vermont. And right here, it says, this is from the Chesterfield town records. And, um, I went in there one time several years ago, um, and they allowed me to look at the books there, which I guess I'm allowed to. And, but it says on here that this piece of land was being conveyed. The Vermont system for conveyances, the deeds are recorded at the town level. There's no county registry of deeds. In New Hampshire, it's a county system. Deeds are recorded at the county. So for this period of time, from about 1781 to 1783, and I didn't look any further back in Chesterfield as to how far back this goes, it could go back as far as 1778. This deed was recorded in the, is recorded in the town of Chesterfield book. And, um, and it says right on it that it's the town of Chesterfield and the county of Washington and the state of Vermont. <laughs> recorded in our town book. Next page. Um, again, it says um, Washington County over here, and it's signed by uh, Samuel King. Um, next. This is a town warrant for 1781 for the town of Chesterfield, County of Washington, State of Vermont. <laughs> and, um, and for that period of time, we were, we were all freemen of the state of Vermont. I was disappointed when I found this, <laughs> that it said state of Vermont. I wanted it to say Republic of Vermont. <laughs> and, uh, okay, next. Uh, 1784, we're starting to get away from all of that dispute. The Revolutionary War is over. This guy, Samuel Holland, who was um, cartographer to the king, um, had begun a project of surveying New Hampshire, but the plan didn't get done until after the war. 
And so this plan is dated 1784. And, you know, at that time, it was probably one of the better plans that existed of the state. Um, within this here, he gives some pretty good descriptions of how he came about the lines. And it, it may be only a surveyor would care about what he's saying. Um, next. Oh, Thomas Jefferson. I, I forgot I left this in there. In 1787, he devi designed a macaroni machine. I don't know if he, um, if he got a patent for it or not, but. Oh. Sorry. Roland. <laughs> okay. We're back to Chesterfield. <laughs> Poor Roland. Um, 1793, Jonas Robbins survey of the Chesterfield Westmoreland line. This is a little clip out of Child's Gazetteer, and it said in it, the perambulations of the line thus described was made in 1793, when the line between Chesterfield and Westmoreland was measured by Jonas Robbins of the latter town. So he was from Westmoreland. Um, and within this, at the same time, he didn't give a link, I think. Oh no, he, he gave the link. It was this other guy here, John, John Braley, who um, surveyed the Swansea line and the Winchester line. And, uh, um, and he didn't give links, he just gave directions. So he just did a, what, a classic perambulation, went from monument to monument. Next. Uh, John Braley was here in town and, um, 1785, he was selectman in 1792, um, and he had 13 kids here in town, and then he moved to Vermont. <laughs> and uh, he was noted as a sea captain in one source. I'm still chasing that down. I'm communicating with the historicals, Rhode Island Historical Society, um, because um, he got married in uh, Cumberland, Rhode Island, which isn't a seacoast town, but it's still he was mentioned as a sea captain. So, and, and the, the wo woman that he married was Mary Streeter, and, and the, the name Streeter was just a little compelling for mm -hmm. why they came to Chesterfield, that there might be some connection. Uh, next, oh, I forgot to say about Jonas Robbins. Um, he was uh, from, um, Westmoreland. He surveyed all of Westmoreland's lines, and then he moved off up to Vermont as well. And the, the Sotsman's uh, plan, I kind of like. It's a stylish uh, plan, but the one thing that caught my eye was that they call, they call Spofford's Lake the Spofford Sea. <laughs> <laughs> and the Spofford Sea. Next. Uh, 1805, um, Chesterfield, in 1805, every town in the state, well, I, let me go back. In sometime in the late 1700s, every town in the state was required to come up with a plan of their town that showed all the main roads passing through the town as well as the town hall, the church, and some other things. And uh, and so the, in the eight, they had to be ready by 1805. And so this is Chesterfield's. I couldn't find any credit to a particular surveyor, uh, but I think I can ferret that out, m maybe by handwriting, I'm hope, because there's, these are all over the place. I mean, you know, every town has one. Uh, next one. This one is uh, Swansea. And, uh, and we're, we're over here. And um, Swansea, there's no name on this one too, but you can clearly see that the hand and writing on this one is way different than the one in Chesterfield. Next, and this only copy I could find of this was in the 
Westmoreland town history. But this is that same 1805 map. But this one's signed by a guy named um, Skinner, Timothy Skinner, surveyor. And if I had a better copy of it and compared it to Chesterfield, you might be able to make a hypothesis that it's the same guy, but. Um, next. And that was all for creating this map, the uh, um, 1860, 16 Carrigan map. And if you've ever been to the State House in New Hampshire, there's a giant version of this map inside the, the State House. Um, but these are all taken by Carrigan. All of those other maps were taken by Carrigan, and then he produced this map. I only showed the um, Cheshire County portion, but actually, Dave only showed the Cheshire County portion. <laughs> I took Dave's view, and it's right there. Um, next. Uh, Ruggles and Eddie, 1817. Nowhere near the quality of the Kerrigan map, but, but the Lake Spofford's kind of screwy looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, the, the one thing too is they call, uh, Wantasticket goes back and forth from West River Mountain to Wantasticket. And uh, next. Ah, these I love. Um, these are um, penmanship maps, some people call them geography maps, done at um, schools. This, this one's from Dr. Dunham's school in Windsor, Vermont, um, which I believe was a school for girls, I, women. They're not women yet. And, um, but she made, uh, Beautiful. This map of New Hampshire, she did a whole atlas, and it was how they taught them geography was they had to make this map, and uh, it, it, it's really quite nice. These things, there's there's hundreds of different ones out there, and, and I got another one in the next slide. This one is um, a girl named Henshaw, hers, and. Uh, I like this representation of Merrimack River. That uh, next, ah, <laughs> now we're in 1824. We've had our lines surveyed in Chesterfield, but here we are. Swansea and Chesterfield are in in a dispute in court. And this is the settlement of the court case between them. And it gives a description of the line. I have not been able to, all I have is this one document. And it's something I collected many years ago. I never, I, I wrote that on it. And, but I never wrote where I got it from. <laughs> and and uh, so, so now I've got to find it again because there's more to it in the beginning and, and probably after. And I probably could find out a lot more information about it. But in 1824, that line gets um, settled. I guess from what little I know about it is there were two corners marking the southeast corner of Chesterfield. And they would either ca they would cause an overlap. Next, uh, 1848, railroads show up. Next, 1849, Nathan Hale's plan, but this is a different Nathan Hale. But he's really interesting if you look up Nathan Hale, and he did a lot of, um, there's a diary of his where he <clears throat> takes a trip around Winnipesaukee and, and stuff at a pretty, in the 1830s, I think. Uh, next. Uh, 1849 uh, survey of Chesterfield. I believe I got this from Dave Allen. Um, and it's by H.H. H. Wheeler. 
And uh, so I tried to go off and find out who H.H. H. Wheeler was. Uh, but there's a lot of detail on, on here of the way the town hall might have looked, I guess. And because um, this is prior to the fire, prior to the fire. Does everybody know what that means? There was the fire, the, sometime in the 50s, I think it was 57 or something like that, the town hall and uh, several other buildings around town got burned down and some farms, even I think outside of town, were burned down. Is in, that in, the whole thing or just an excerpt? I'm sorry? Is that the whole map? Yeah, that's the whole map. That's all there is. This kid was 16 years old when he made this map and he was a student at the Chesterfield Academy. Uh-huh. And, uh, and uh, next slide. And Hoyt H. Wheeler, um, I have some information on him, and, but his family and him moved away from Chesterfield to uh, New Fame, Vermont. And he later on becomes the U.S. District Court for, he was um, appointed by President Hayes to the U.S. District Court for the District of Vermont in 1877, position which he still, <laughs> still holds. I got this out of a history that was written in the late 1800s, but um, next. We should find out more about him, though. Uh, there's probably a lot to be found, and I don't know if perhaps, um, I think he ends up in Jamaica, if there, there are Hoyt Wheeler papers or something like that. You know, maybe he, maybe there's field notes that go with that plan. I don't. Um, okay, 1858. Everybody knows this map. I think uh, historical people, and it, it's kind of the first one that gives us names and roads and all of that kind of stuff. But this is Chesterfield. The north line of Chesterfield's on the seam, on this one. And then go to the next slide. And on a different version of the plan, it's like this. And I said, well, why is that? And next slide. This one's on a true north meridian. Remember our declination thing? This one's on a magnetic. So that's why on the two plans, the juxtaposition of the town is different. Uh, this, I think I got this from the NOAA website more recently, but I think Dave Allen gave me a copy of this as well. Um, but I couldn't find the one he gave me, so I went back to the, um, so, but this is the way the 1858 map was created, or the base information for compiling the map was with these, I'll call it a waywiser, or um, in Rome they would have called it a hodometer. <laughs> and, um, uh, and he's got a compass slung on his back. And I'm not exactly sure, I, I assume uh, that this hanging here is probably a chain, a surveyor's chain. But, but the, all of those county maps were produced in, in a similar fashion. Next, 1877 map. Um, I, Chesterfield is upside down, but I don't like, I want north up. up. <laughs> so, um, 1877 map. I mean, this, this is the same. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of flaws on this map, I, I, but it still gives you the names and the roads of what was there then, even though they're a little distorted and everything, it still gives you that um, of who was there. Next. Oh, 1877 Walling. Um, Walling was a, that the other maps, the 1858 maps were done by um, Smith. Was that it, Dave? Smith and somebody. And, um, 
And then the 1877, I forget who that one's by, but Walling was a big producer of maps in, for a lot of Vermont towns, like I think Wyndham County was a Walling uh, map. Um, but this is the first map that I found or of Chesterfield that had contours on it. And contours uh, prior to the uh, Civil War, um, they used a, what were called hatchures, which was a method of shading. And by the length of the little hatchures on the side slope, and if they were longer, it was a gentler slope. If they were closer together, it was a steeper slope. And if they were really close together, they were, it gave you the feeling that they were even steeper. And, uh, and, and that's how they did things. And then in the, I found maps done by um, military engineers during the war where they were drawing contours on the maps. Then they were making their hatchures and then they would re erase the contour lines. And uh, <clears throat> finally, somebody said, huh, that doesn't make any sense. We can just use the contour lines. And, uh, and so after, at this point in time, it, contours start to take over every, um, I think some of the first contour maps were down in Rhode Island, I think, um, earlier than that, earlier than the Civil War, but. Um, next. And then this map comes along in, in the geological uh, study of New Hampshire and, um, by a guy named Charles Henry Hitchcock. And I only put this, this shows the hills and slopes of till. And, and I'm sure there are other ones that show ledge outcrops and whatever. I didn't go study Hitchcock's um, three volume set of maps and, and geology. But, um, but the contours on this map are a little different than on the previous one. So somehow these contours were developed about the same year. And uh, uh, there may be more to know about this map and how it was produced, but I would imagine that Charles Henry Hitchcock spent some time here and probably stayed in one of the hotels that was here in around 1877 or on the lake while he was doing this map. And I, I would imagine that he could go around and he could vacation in every town and then do his geological <laughs> uh, studies. Anyway, next. This is a Charles Henry Hitchcock. His father was uh, the president of Amherst College and he was gonna be a theologian, but he ended up working for his father um, as, a, as an assistant, it says it here somewhere, but in, his father ends up being appointed a geologist in Vermont and he was his assistant. And he decided that he liked geology, so he went back and studied geology and then um, he became the state geologist of Maine and then later of New Hampshire after that, he taught geology at Dartmouth College and mineralogy for many, many years. And then he retires and he moves to Honolulu and studies volcanoes. And I think there's a whole another set of writings of his about volcanoes. And uh, next, this is um, just um, more about him, uh, about him, his life at at Dartmouth College and um, that his students um, nicknamed him type because he um, talked in terms of type localities for geology, so they called him type. I don't know. Next, 1892 Atlas, um, just another one of those. This, this one, however, is the whole state in one, um, document. I, I tried to find out anything I could about her. This was made by Hurd and Company from Boston. And I tried to look up Hurd and Company, but I, I didn't really get any, anything. And um, somebody with a little more savvy with that internet um, 
searching <laughs> could find something on the Herden Company. Next, close-ups of the villages. Next, ah, now we're up to USGS maps. 1893, 18, uh, Vermont, I mean Brattleboro, 1898, Chesterfield. I kind of put them together here as best I could, but these are the first real um, controlled surveys of the, of, I don't know how controlled the survey of the town was, but of the features, it was controlled by a, a geodetic network so that the relationships of things were pretty exacting as opposed to all of the other maps that we've seen. Uh, next, ah, it's Bofford Lake. And a beautiful map done by Samuel Wadsworth from Keene. Um, Sam was an amazing guy. Anybody know much about Sam Wadsworth? He was the uh, surveyor and civil engineer for the city and produced all kinds of work. He also produced that Nathan um, Wild, um, he, the declination report, and he had his own declination report and right. that he published next. And he's also a wall dog. <laughs> and, um, City engineer, he drew detailed sketches of every street. A lot of stuff that they listed on the wall dog thing, um, you know, as a description of what he had done, um, it really makes me want to go write something better about him. Uh, next, 1899, the, uh, they're perambulating the line and they hired a guy, uh, William F. Flint, surveyor, and he documented the perambulation of Winchester and Chesterfield in 1899. Is that List another court case? No, it's not another court case. This is um, a friendly perambulation between the two towns. And he, he says on here that, that the selectmen of the both towns got together, and apparent, from what he says there, I believe the selectmen walked the line with him after he surveyed it. And it says on there, it took him three days to survey this line. And uh, next, hey. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to thank Dave Allen, Jay Morris, who um, became quite u useful. Don't tell him I said that <laughs> for doing research that I didn't have time to do. And, uh, and Google Harvard College, which I do, the um, Hazen plan came from Harvard College, the Beinecke Library, which I mentioned, William Clements Library, I don't, I can't, some things here were from the William Clements Library. Um, the Osher Map Library, um, Library of Congress, uh, Historical Society of Cheshire County, some things, uh, Rhode Island Historical Society, uh, NOAA for the declination report, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and Rumsey Maps. And that's it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> when are you going to be able to do the second Say it again. The second presentation, when are you going to be able to do that? When do you want me to do it? <laughs> well, these people in the room might want to know. That's why yeah. I'm asking. Um, I probably would be ready in a couple of months. Month? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That took a long time. And uh, Dave, speaking of perambulation, um, in, in New Hampshire, like other New England states, uh, the state requires that all towns um, conduct a perambulation of the town boundaries every seven years. Yeah. And I was wondering if you've ever partaken in, in helping the I town elders or selectmen do that. I've 
done a couple things here in Chesterfield. Um, I've not done any in any, I have surveyed town lines for um, different towns and I've surveyed along the town line quite a bit. Um, when, when Dave Allen and I first met, I believe, I was surveying his property which has a common boundary with the Westmoreland. And, uh, and I was working for Forest Hall at the time, and he's a local surveyor here in Chesterfield. And um, the uh, uh, perambulation requirements here in New Hampshire is every seven years. It used to be every three, and they moved it to seven because they felt that three years were too onerous. And um, what's that? <laughs> I will do it again. Yeah. The, um, in, in Vermont, they don't, I don't believe they require it. Is Malcolm still here? <coughs> he's, he's stuck out. There was a Vermont surveyor here, and um, he, um, he might know, but I, I'm pretty sure that in Vermont they don't require perambulations, and their town lines are a mess over there. <laughs> yeah. You have another question? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the perambulations that I've seen just don't list any, any surveyor being involved. No, they don't have to have a surveyor right. involved. <laughs> and one other thing, uh, I'm fascinated by that really nice map you made of all the New Hampshire towns that seceded from New Hampshire. Right. And I have checked the, I live in Unity up north of here, and our town decided not to join Vermont. I'm just interested in seeing whether that shows up. Unity is just south of Claremont. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I didn't label them all, and uh, I did that in 2009, and... <laughs> <laughs> well, Unity has a pretty distinctive shape. Instead of being a rectangle or a parallelogram or anything, it's a, it's a sort of a scrawny, Wedge that comes uh -huh. out to about 36 square miles, but it's uh, it's pretty recognizable on, on a map. And I, I, there was a specific town meeting at which the mo the article was you know sell it to see if the town will vote to to join Vermont and leave New Hampshire, and it was uh, I know that resoundingly defeated. That that happened everywhere. Um, the ones that I know the most about are the ones close to me here. Um, Hinsdale voted to be part of Vermont. Winchester voted not to be. Richmond voted to be. And, and that left Richmond as an island <laughs> that wasn't connected. Yes? Thank you so much. This was an excellent presentation. I'm a scuba diver, and you have two maps here tonight that are excellent. I want to thank you. And my question is, um, the very beginning of your presentation, you talked about this book what, that was the at the time the um, first bestseller and, um, in America. Oh. Um, what was the name of that book again? Uh, the the um, about Mary what about Mary Rollins, Rollins. Rollins. Oh, being bring captured? It up right here. Yeah, up to Mary Rawlinson's captivity. I have a copy of Restoration. How about that? Ah. He has it right here. That's awesome. I see, I never heard of that. Thank you so much. Okay. One other thing I wanted to say about the Vermont and New Hampshire, or about the perambulations is there's a and you mentioned that it doesn't have to be done by a surveyor. And part of the reason for that, um, however, a surveyor could get involved in it if, if the selectman couldn't decide. That's when the surveyor gets involved. If you get the two towns together and one of them says, I don't agree with that, then that's when the surveyor gets involved. But you're talking, that's not a, um, a property boundary. Sometimes it is but it's a statutory boundary. Statutory boundaries are different than um, uh, property boundaries. Property boundaries, the two landowners can acquiesce or agree and align. The towns, in theory, can't do that. 
but they can. But once they've done that and they've agreed that, okay, we both believe the lines here, but that doesn't agree with the statutory location. So they, they petition the legislature and the legislature fixes the line at the agreed to point, but it still has to go through that legislative process in order to <coughs> fix it as the line. Although I've seen towns that have agreed, they never went through the statutory process, years and years have gone by and everybody's been maintaining this as the town line. It's kind of hard to argue with after 50 years or something. Can you say where that, in the RSAs, that, that procedure is? Oh, uh, um, <laughs> No. There's a boundary between Charlestown and, and Unity, which is in some dispute. Uh -huh. And I'd be interested in knowing if, where the, the law is that... that uh, Even the, the idea of the difference between statutory boundaries and property boundaries is disputed even amongst surveyors and lawyers. So um, it's, it's a complicated thing, but it seems to always come out the same way in the end, is that either the court fixes it in a certain position, like in the Chesterfield case, that was the court fixing the line in a position, and or the legislature, if it's a friendly um, dispute, the legislature can fix it. David, yeah. um, if you look up um, uh, Article 3, Chapter 51 of the state statutes, then you'll find what you're looking for. Chapter 51. Section, uh, Chapter 3, Section, I have it wrong. Section 3, Chapter 51. Thank you. Folks, um, if anyone else no, is interested uh, in bidding you, on uh, these, the silent auction, these three maps over here, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> According to my research, they voted to be. But well, you, you decide. You